Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, Please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Well, hello, everyone. Today, my guest is Kate Ekman. She is a Columbia University certified executive leadership coach. Kate is with me to discuss her new book, The Full Spirit Workout. Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to connect with you and your audience. Yes. Well, we're happy to have you here too. So what an interesting title. Is is that a pun or a play on anything, full spirit workout? Absolutely. So it's a play on the full body workout that mm-hmm. you often hear advertised at the gym, but it's also about bringing your full spirit to everyone you meet and everything that you do. Mm-hmm. It's showing up like you mean it. It's your authentic truth and power, your passion, your presence. You know, so many people say, I'm not reaching my goals or I'm not living the life that I want. I don't feel fulfilled. And I say with love, um, but you're not showing up like you mean it, or I don't really believe that you want this thing that you say you want. So I think this is everyone's opportunity to really get clear about what's really going on with them at their core, take Mm -hmm. a deep dive, get underneath the hood of the car and also explore what you really want. And I, as a writer, I have really in in italics, you know, I think a lot of us know what we want. And it's often dictated by societal standards. We don't even believe in what mom and dad want or would be proud of us for what Sally, the neighbor's doing, you know, what our siblings are doing, friends are doing. So this is really discovering what you really, really want. And then, and then allowing that to happen for yourself. So the core self or or the authentic self, which, you know, so many of us, uh, so many of my clients and, and my uh, co-host client, uh, Kyle's clients, we come in, I think, largely because of that disconnect between parts of ourself or aspects of ourself and, and, and like you said, that authenticity. So it sounds like this could be a very helpful, like adjunct to psychotherapy for people who are looking for something for their patients or clients and, and just for anybody out there who, who might want to, uh, get more in touch with themselves. Yeah, a friend of mine, Chris, and in Boston is a psychotherapist, mm-hmm. and he recommends this book to his clients to, to do exactly what you just said. And mm-hmm. I think that, you know, we're all guilty of doing all of the things that society says we should do to feel worthy and valuable and loved. And many of us have achieved the success or we look the part, but then we still don't feel the fulfillment. And that's what I work with a lot of my clients who are millionaires, billionaires, professional mm-hmm. athletes, very successful business men and women. And I work with them on, on the fulfillment piece a lot of the times because, or they're not good at having uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. They, um, are lacking in confidence. And you think, how can someone that successful materially anyway, um, not be confident, but the two don't always equate. You know, I've recently had a woman in a live TV interview, say something to me like, um, well, you're young and beautiful. You get whatever you want. And I think, wow, is, is that what we're doing to people still? First of all, judging them, which means we're judging ourselves. But also there's this misconception that if you look a certain way or you have a certain amount of money that you don't struggle. And I think, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of psychologist Susan David's work, but she talks about this toxic positivity. And I, I consider myself a very positive person, but I'd rather be real than positive. And Mm -hmm. I think the sooner that we can admit to ourselves that we're struggling or something sucks, or we we need some assistance from a coach, a therapist, a friend, uh, the the sooner that we can really achieve the level of success, true success that we want, and and really start feeling that meaning and fulfillment in our lives that is lacking in so many cases. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's people are so much in denial or Or we assume (laughs) that someone like, uh, let's say, uh, an attractive young woman or by society standards attractive, that she doesn't suffer on some level or doesn't have like uh, 
you know, skeletons in her closet that, that chase her about. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a kind of vapidness or, or desert like phenomena that I think happens with people when we, and we kind of buy into these things when we're younger, right? Like we buy into the myth of money will make you happy or, or, uh, having, you know, being, having the best car or the you know, perfect clothing or finery, right, will help us. And then we realize after a while, I think that that's probably not going to make you very happy, right? Uh, I'm curious, like, talking about authenticity, and one of the themes that keeps coming up from my clients a lot uh, is the the difference between how people felt and thought before covid the pandemic and the restrictions and the lockdowns and remote work versus how they felt before where everybody was kind of like, you know, like Valentine Michael Smith from stranger in a strange land would describe people as busy, 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 like always running around. Like, have you noticed that in your clientele? I mean, I know you work with like executive coaches and, and everyday folks, but have you noticed that at all? Like a shift in people's like awareness um, if we could, I'd like, to, I'd like to answer that, but first go back to something that you said that, um, I, I really appreciated that you did and this, and, and listen, I, I like nice things as much as the next person, but, ah. uh, in, in, in my, in all of my research and in my own life has dictated that all of the things that we think are going to make us happy, the house, the car, the good looks, the good looking partner, mm-hmm. all of the shiny objects research shows again and again, it actually doesn't move the needle and our well being. Mm-hmm. What moves the needle are what I call our spiritual vitamins, mm-hmm. things like sleep, exercise, time affluence, social connection, acts of kindness and service, gratitude visits, which is one of my favorite things I wrote about in the book, where you you write a letter to someone who has profoundly changed your life for the better, who you've never properly thanked, and you and you call them up and say, I'd like to come over, or I had to do it on Zoom, and mm-hmm. you read them this letter. And what happens is your well-being and the other person's well-being is so boosted, not just in that moment, but for days and weeks and months and years to come. My, my exercise proved this. Mm-hmm. And this isn't my, I didn't come up with this. This is from Martin Seligman, who I'm sure, as you know, oh, is, yeah, is yeah, the yeah. founder of positive psychology. He did a brilliant TED talk on this, but I invite and encourage everyone to, to do this activity because this will improve your well-being more than I think really anything. It's free. All of those things I just listed are free. You don't have to have a Harvard degree. You don't have to look like a supermodel. You don't have to be a millionaire. All of us have access to these tools. You will feel so much better. And so I had to say that because you talked about that. And I think, you know, I do experience judgment or people think, oh, well, my must be nice to be you. And you know what? It is nice to be me, but it doesn't mean I am human. I, you know, right. like people mm-hmm. can say that about you. Well, you have this education, you make this money, you help people do this. We all have our struggles. And I think the more that we could have a, a little bit more compassion, starting with ourselves and extending that outward, the better. Um, the authenticity piece and what I'm noticing with clients is that uh, I think a lot of people are letting some of the nonsense fall away. So those things that whether it's relationships with people or it's the, those, you know, toxic friends or coworkers, it's, I think now people are like, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. And I think now some organizations are the ones that were fortunate enough. You know, I work with a lot of private equity folks who <laughs> had a great year last year. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, so, but I think with them, it's, they're struggling with the burnout. And again, what does all this mean? These clients, it's like, okay, I can close another multi-million dollar deal. I don't need another Ferrari. I don't need any more of this. What does it all mean? So that's on the one extreme on that end. I think on the other end, people are just, they're not communicating well with others. You know what? Or if you're stuck at home with someone, you think some relationships flourish as I'm sure you've seen and others Mm -hmm. are, it's like, why are we even together. So I, I think it's been the great equalizer. And, and I, what I'm hoping is that people have had a moment to stop, to take a pause and, and really reflect upon what's working and what isn't. That's one of my favorite spiritual practices is what I call my mm-hmm. sit and stare time mm-hmm. and take a moment, at least five minutes a day to stare out the window and check in with yourself like you would a small child. How are you doing? Mm-hmm. What's working? 
what can I do for you? It sounds so simple because it is, but I'm finding, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. People are so uncomfortable sitting in a room quietly by themselves without all the distractions. And I think it's an epidemic and even starting with this simple practice, it, it, it can transform your life. It's helped my well-being so much. It's it's really that simple practice has gotten me through COVID um, to come out flourishing rather mm-hmm. than <laughs> well, rather than the latter. Yeah. Well, I, I can say from from uh, cognitive science, we know that um, there is something to be said for daydreaming because you know how you have like various uh, wave cycles in your brain. You know, when you you sleep and you go through stage one, stage two, et cetera, you go from like beta to alpha waves to theta waves, dreaming sleep, delta, dreamless sleep. That same pattern actually happens in the background, whether you're awake or alive or awake or sleeping, right? And um, there have been studies that show those what they call not circadian or or 24-hour clock rhythms of rest to to activity, but... um, the more ultradian, the small units of time. We, we tend to be active in the morning, most of us who are uh, larks, not night owls, right? It's a little bit different. Some of the studies have shown for, for the night owls. But it's that pattern of when you do wake up and your clock starts you know, burning the energy, usually in the afternoon, you need to take about a 20-minute break, which is the same period of like REM sleep, right? Because your brain is actually going to be going into a slower wave of activity. And guess what? It's a perfect time to sit and stare out the window, right? Like how many times have you been in a class or a lecture in elementary or elsewise, and you you just check out? Even, even if you don't have a, an ADHD diagnosis, you're going to check out because your brain – and what, they're, what they've learned is that your brain is, has only much, so much bandwidth for taking the information in, and then it has to like form new memories and accumulate and consolidate new memories. And that's what's happening on one level, with dreaming and with daydreaming. So it's a very important thing for you to do. But I think you're right. Most people are trained to not do that and to live on clock time. And, you know, they, and then we get into this cycle where we think if we just turn off the lights, it's sleep time, right? I'll go to sleep. And then all of the material from day is just, it's just nattering around in your head and and gnawing at you. A lot of people. Yeah. And, and, I, I think there's this notion too, where, and I, I, this is, Hey, this used to be my MO and that's how I was raised. I mean, my father would always call me up like, what are you doing today? What are you working on? How much money are you making? And I remember finally, I could see the growth in myself where it was a Tuesday afternoon and I wasn't doing anything. You know, I'm an independent contractor and entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So I have that luxury, but I said, I'm not doing anything, dad. And there was a pause <laughs> and he was like, Oh, it sounds great. I'm glad you're resting or relaxing. And it's just this, this hustle culture that I no longer subscribe to because when I, I care for myself and take that downtime, I'm able to then to sit down at my desk and do twice the amount of work. And half the time, my productivity and creativity soars. Mm-hmm. I feel a whole heck of a lot better. I'm not going to say something grumpy to a loved one and, and cause a rift in a relationship. I'm not overwhelmed and exhausted. And a friend recent, an overachiever friend recently said to me, you know, your book helped me in that. I thought I was being lazy. If I took that time to sit and stare or took the breaks. And she said, now I'm realizing I'm actually accomplishing something. And I said, yeah. And that time you're accomplishing rest, rejuvenation, you're letting your brain relax. And I think we need to start, this is counterintuitive to our society, as you know, but I think we need to start having these conversations more and inviting people in and giving them that, that friendly, gentle, but a a bit firm reminder. Cause it's like, come on people. Um, you know, what kind of life do you want to have? And I think we really owe it to ourselves to, to care for ourselves in this way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, that sounds like a, a pretty good spot for us to jump off to the contents of this cool book that you've written. Like, um, you did mention the gratitude visits, but is there any, you know, maybe you can kind of walk us through, I don't know if they're steps or they're just like exercises and that are connected to elements of your mind body, uh, functioning or, and how would you like to kind of like to describe your book and, and the way it's, uh, uh, set up to help people. 
I think my book is a life resource tool, and I'm, I'm actually taking that from another podcast host who said that, and I love huh. how he phrased that. And I thought, yeah, he said it's just a life resource tool you can turn to again and again, and it's directional, mm-hmm. not, not linear, so you can skip around. It has the journaling exercises for people who are into that. It's got the meditations that you can self-record. They're also have been mixed and mastered professionally and they're on my website. So you can listen to them and really go on a a self-exploring journey, um, journey of self-discovery. Those are free there. And we have the coach Kate check-ins. I know not everyone can afford executive coaching or, um, you know, leadership or life coaching. So I'm really asking the questions that I ask of myself and my clients that I, it's a whole person coaching technique. So questions you've probably never pondered or reflected on before to really get underneath the hood of the car. So experience the the growth and transformation. Mm -hmm. And then I end each step or or chapter with the affirmation. So you're really grounding that into your body. There's a, a saying by a native American tribe that says, you know, it's only, it's only rumor until it lives in the body, meaning, you know, our, our brain has that, the intelligence factor, but for something to really be wisdom, we have to move it down into our hearts and our bones. Think of driving a car. Wisdom lives in your body, lives in your bones. We don't have to get in and think, okay, now I'm going to put my foot on the brake and yeah, you just get in and go. It's wisdom. We've done it so many times. So that's why I like this book because these, these practices and strategies can become that wisdom where then that becomes your default setting rather than striving or forcing or trying to control outcomes. You just become the person who attracts the experiences and opportunities and, and relationships that you've really been craving. And you, you become a whole self-actualized version of yourself, but it is like physical exercise. You can't just show up in your cute outfit at the gym and and stand around. You have to put in the work and your personal trainer, in this case, me, I can't do the sit-ups and push-ups for you. It's on you, but then the results are yours as well. Okay. Well, uh, maybe you can kind of take us through one of the steps. You mentioned the gratitude visits. Maybe you can go into a little bit more uh, about that particular step. Well, that's, that's an exercise in step three, which is feel the burn. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I start that chapter off talking about a story when I was four years old. And I feel like that's ultimately where the full spirit workout was born as I was writing this and, and, and really, um, going deep within myself and, you know, being this little kid at swim lessons that I didn't really want to be in. My mom signed me up like most of our moms do. And overhearing the swim instructor say to my mom one day that he didn't think I was a very good swimmer. And how sad as an adult that my little four-year-old self translated that comment, some opinion of some Mm -hmm. guy at the swim club into a mentality that said, oh my gosh, I have to perform at a really high level so that I'm safe in the world. And my mom and dad will love me and be proud of me. And I guess it's important to impress strangers at the swim club. I better step up my game or it's going to be rough out there for me. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, on a positive side, I was very ambitious, very driven young girl. I, I broke every record, but two at that swim club and every event and every age group, I was a state and national champion off to Penn state on a swimming school scholarship, but at what cost? I I was, I was filled with turmoil much of my life and anxiety and insecurity. And this obsession with performance left me with the pain of anxiety. And I think that happens to all of us. And at at some point, you know, this probably better than anyone. We have these childhood wounds. Something is said to us when we're little kids, we make that lie, our truth. We go about our lives, collecting evidence for why that is true. It becomes a core belief system and it affects us so negatively. Negatively, and we don't even realize it. So for me, it's really cleaning up these thoughts, acknowledging them, deleting them like you would a corrupt file on your computer, and then co-creating. And that's where the spirituality comes in, co-creating with a force greater than ourselves, whether you believe in God, mm-hmm. spirit, universe, nature, the, the divine wisdom that turns the acorn into the oak tree, the embryo into a baby, you know, it's there, it's working on your behalf behind the scenes, whether you believe in it or not, I choose to believe in it. Well, you did mention that uh, you were so enthusiastic because of the negative response you had regarding your, uh, your swimming uh, capabilities that you overachieved. And it, it, you were, it was reinforced for you all those years, right? And then you even got on a scholarship to UPenn, right? Right? Penn State. Penn State, sorry. And so you went to Penn State and, uh, I mean, 
how could you not want to stay in that mode for so long, right? And because it rewarded you, and so much of society is that kind of like, you know, if you do this, you will get that, or if, if when you do this, you will have more of this, and the more the better kind of mentality. Um, yeah, I, I think in my own life, I, I kind of had what you were saying. I was, I was remembering as a child, I was always. Um, involved in the arts. And I went on a scholarship to uh, a, a private uh, art college after high school, right? And got some blue ribbons and whatnot for some competitions. Uh, but over the years, I, I too noticed that like there was something about that that was just not, uh, there was something about the reward not being there. It just wasn't as, as heavy. So it kind of fell away from me in some level, right? I mean, it's still there with me, right? Obviously, all the training that you had for swimming, I mean, that's hours and hours. And you can probably get into a pool or a lake and you're back in your element, right? And having fun. And, and I assume that might even be your favorite mode of exercise. I actually don't really swim at all anymore. That's that's a whole other funny story. <laughs> You're all swimmed um, out. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm all I'm all swimmed out. But um, you know, even as you're talking, I'm thinking of because that's what happens to our brains. Oh, like the neurosciences of, of our brain is that it gets used to stuff. And so mm -hmm. that was my whole life too. You achieve and you achieve and you achieve or, or you go to the fancy resort or you get the fancy whatever and your brain gets used to it. So you need more and more and more and more. It becomes this insatiable, insatiable, vicious cycle. And, and that's, that's like, you know, when it's I had my, my wake up calls, it's, it's, it's an it's addiction. An ad Addiction. It's an app. I mean, even as I talk about it, I'm getting so revved up because it's that notion of when we place our value outside of ourselves, when we allow it to be dictated by all the externals, we can truly never have enough or be enough. And that's exactly, why you yeah. see, or I work with these clients, I'm thinking you are a billionaire and you are not fulfilled. And it's no diss or judgment on that person, but it proves the point. And, and so, oh, yeah, um, yeah you know, strive for all the things you want, but it, it has to come from within. And, and that's what this book is. It is that, that inner fitness tool yeah. that I just want to share with the world. Cause I'm clearly so passionate about it because it works if, if you do, and to build that contentment from within is worth its weight in gold. And if this past year taught me anything, it's that I have to build the confidence and resilience and optimism that can weather any storm because sadly the chaos and uncertainty and complete nonsense and sickness of the world isn't going anywhere. So it's really up to us to, to combat that emotional gravity that we're all susceptible mm. to. Yeah. I, I, it reminds me, um, I had Daniel Brown, who's a Harvard psychologist who works a lot with attachment theory and, and he's built an integrative model for helping people with attachment, right? Which is all about, largely it's all about people looking for, to other people for their self-esteem, right? And there's, you know, the whole course in uh, taking his course, he was kind of enough to you know, give me access to that and um, read the book that he and his team have worked on. It's an evidence-based uh, practice. The the core element, when you get through all of the attachment work, you can work with people on self-esteem. So it's like getting through this, like putting too much weight on someone else's good opinion or society's good opinion, these attachments to wealth or fame that are somehow, they're, it's carrot and stick. You can never be, it's, it's like an endless carrot and stick or... Um, the apple of Tantalus, right? Like from Greek mythology where tantalizing comes, the, the, the word comes from like, Tantalus was as a curse by the gods, like he was stuck into his head up in water, right? And he was very hungry because he was stuck in water. You couldn't leave the pool. And this apple was kind of like uh, hovered above his mouth and taken away from him and hovered above and he could never even get a bite of it. You know, so it was always hungry and tantalized by the apple, so to speak. And I think that's so much of us in our relationships, in our day-to-day uh, -day living, and in, in how we define ourselves in our work roles. I think so many of us are, we're going through that kind of addiction and tantalizing addiction. As, as, uh, yeah. as, as Oscar Wilde said, uh, uh, the only thing I can't resist is temptation, right? <laughs> right? And that's, we're, we're yeah. tempted by it over and over and over again. 
and I think we spend so much time in our mind, the the ego yeah. mind for me that the game changer has been tuning into. And, and first of all, even acknowledging that there is a, a divine wisdom and it is like that computer file that we just need to download mm-hmm. into our mind mm-hmm. and, and tapping into that because our spirits can never be rejected or criticized. It, it, our minds are just... The, I mean, the ego mind is literally out to destroy us, not just inconvenience us, but destroy us. And that's why for me, I've got to take that time, whether it's the meditation, the mm-hmm. sit and stare, or just the acknowledgement of, whoa, you are really spinning out right now. You're obsessing over that negative comment or whatever the thing is and, and taking that moment to connect with the spirit and really the truth of who we are and, and getting deeper than just that surface level. I look at, at this work as as scuba diving. You know, most of us are, are sitting in the boat at the surface of the ocean and it's fine, but really getting underneath all of that. And that's where all those beautiful fish are. And that's why people you know, yeah. go through the effort to, to do the scuba diving. It's fascinating. It might be a little scary or you think, oh, I might not be able to breathe or what happens if, but Ooh, that's when life gets really juicy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the more you cut away the excess, the, the fat, the stuff that's really not helping you, right? It's like excess calories, right? You know, the more you get down to like a lean, healthy diet, a, a spiritual diet or a mental diet. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm curious, like, uh, Kate, how did the, how did you come about with this book? What was the, how did the book develop? Was it an organic process working with your clients and researching things that worked? And, and how, I'm just curious about how it came together because it does sound like it was kind of an organic process that you, you almost sound, it sounds almost like you put yourself through it while you were writing it. Absolutely. And I love this question. I, yeah, I've been a journalist my whole life and mm-hmm. I was writing several articles for different publications, but really it was losing two dear friends to suicide in one year, my wow. ex-boyfriend wow. and a best friend who we were on and off again for 10 years romantically. And mm. I mean, it's, I guess one wasn't enough. And so my world just blew up. I had some very dark moments uh, myself during that wow. time, as you yeah. can imagine, a lot of questioning, two of the most beautiful souls I've ever known to Mm -hmm. leave us in such a tragic and shocking way was obviously traumatizing. And, um, you, there, you never, you never get over that, Mm -hmm. right. Even talking about it, 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 it's hard. Um, so talking about it, doing the the press for this book, it's just an emotional hangover every day. And, and certainly none of us grow up and and say, I want to be a suicide prevention activist when I grow up, but, that's where I am. I've accepted this life assignment. I'm honored to do the work. It's hard. It's heartbreaking. Nobody wants to talk about it. Um, there's still such a stigma and, um, a lot of judgment around this topic, whether it's suicide or mental illness or mental health. And so, you know, I had to go through my own grieving process, but also looking at the way I was choosing to live my life. Someone who, like nearly everybody, quite frankly, was placing the worth outside of myself. And I needed the the keys for a better way of living. I, mm-hmm. I went back to school. I, I studied neuroscience and positive psychology and the whole person person coaching techniques extensively at you know, incredible universities and just, I mean, really put myself through more degrees and certifications <laughs> than I can even wrap my head around because I was really, really determined and, and committed. And this wasn't just about me because when I looked around, I saw how much everybody is struggling. And I'm sure, I mean, it's in your profession too. You, you see it and, and you want to help. And so, um, I think even just speaking very candidly about it and, um, not pretending. And I, I always say that to my clients when we get on a call or we're in person, I say, listen, this is a no pretend zone. I think people need to be really seen and heard and acknowledged. And, and often we are not even by the people who love us or, or claim to love us. So it was a natural next step in my career. Um, it pushed me past the point of no return in every way, shape and form. <laughs> it's a, a ton of work. Um, I wrote every word in this, in this book, which a lot of authors don't. Have a, have and a ghost writer. Was, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're a journalist. Was, yeah, I would, I would exactly. assume yeah. <laughs> exactly. you probably, like, oh, and, and, gosh. and you weren't, you weren't, they used to write for column inch, right? But the, this is no holds bar. You can probably, you, you, the, any kind of chains were off of you, right? Just some degree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was really healing and, and therapeutic and, mm. um, 
I, I just, you know, I worked really hard on it and I, I just want everyone, I want everyone who reads it or experiences me in, in person or online to just feel a bit more, um, hopeful and at ease and, and strengthened. That's, that's really what I want my gift and book and legacy to be is I just want people to feel better in my presence and, mm-hmm. and really, um, be inspired to be who they really are. And that who you really are is awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's wonderful that, that you, you've hit upon this and, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful little tome that, uh, I think can have great big benefits for a lot of people. Um, I'd like you to plug your website. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can find me online at kateekman.tv. It's K A T E E C K M A N.tv, like the tube you watch. And for more information on the book, it's the full spirit And it's, it's everywhere books are sold, um, in stores and online. And would love to connect with people on the interwebs. It really is a supportive community that's all about collaboration and support as opposed to the competition and all the other stuff that's out there. It really is. It, it was really my, my mission to create a, a, a lovely place on the interwebs, which can mm-hmm. be a little, <laughs> yeah, which can be a little bit caustic. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. are you still taking uh, a private clients or are you, you book solid? I mean, if anybody wants to reach out for you, they can, they get, they can reach to yeah, you there absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Okay. All the info's on my website. Absolutely. Okay. And you did mention, uh, Suicide prevention as uh, one of your uh, passions, right? So do you have, is there a a particular nonprofit that you could recommend uh, or a website that you might have off the tip of your tongue? Yeah, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is an incredible organization, someone I, you know, organization I work with and donate to, and they do so much wonderful work. So I think anyone who is struggling, please please reach out to professionals like yourself, to organizations like this. There are so many resources mm-hmm. available, as you know, and I'm just reminding people and you're not alone and we care and, and we want you here and um, not just existing, but but really thriving in your life. And there's so many tools to help and people to help you do that. I think sometimes people forget. And I, I know even as myself, someone who absolutely hates asking for support, something I need, I'm working through mm-hmm. consciously, mm-hmm. intentionally, deliberately. But um, I think a lot of people feel like a burden, even with their own friends or family. And I think especially those of us who are kind of known as the energetic life of the party, people, in my experience, don't really know what to do with you when you're sad or angry or having a hard time. And um, that that's sad. But there are plenty of people who are willing to help. Largely, people do not feel heard. So if you can do your listening and, and hearing and understanding with people who are, are suffering, it, it does help because I think it comes to, you know, our society is about it, more and more so, especially with the advent of the internet, it's about talking at rather than listening with. So if you can, if you can develop, those of you out there who know someone who might be suffering, uh, suicide, or not, uh, it's the idea of being able to, and just being kind, listening, listening to yourself, you know, stop talking in your head, you know, perhaps one of the ways you can learn to do that more is with this book, the full spirit workout. Okay. I, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Maybe I, I'm biased. <laughs> I, I think you're, you're pretty spot on with that, Kate. Well, thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. I really appreciate this. And, uh, I feel, I feel it's this nice divine spark here. I I do too. I I feel like I don't want it to end. I feel like we could go on and on. These are such important conversations to have. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing to help so many in the world. It's, it's so important. And, um, I'd love to keep the, the conversation going and I hope whoever is listening talks to someone that they love about this conversation and we can just start normalizing these types of topics and, and really talking about the, the depths of us instead of just the weather and what we had for dinner. <laughs> How are you? Good. Me too. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, thank you so much. And uh, if you like, maybe we'll have you back on uh, at some point in the future if something comes up. Okay. I thank would you, love Kate. that. Thank, thank you so much. You're welcome.
Thanks for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know that the Psychology Talk podcast has a Facebook page and an Instagram page? It's true. You can find more information about other guests and episodes, as well as more information about psychology and mental health. And if you liked this episode, go ahead and like us on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, or Spotify and leave a review. It helps us grow our audience and provide more quality shows. All material, copyright the Psychology Talk podcast. This podcast is for informative and entertainment purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. <laughs>